Welcome everyone who's tuning in. We're gonna get started here in a minute. Until then, we invite you to share your name and where you're tuning in from in the chat. We got some folks from North Carolina and West Virginia, New Mexico, welcome. California, some more North Carolina, Massachusetts, Florida. This is really exciting. We had 600 folks registered today and we've been having close to 300 at times for these webinars. Really great to be sharing this evening with you all. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm Katie Trazo. I'm the coordinator of the Virginia Tech Catawba Sustainability Center's Forest Herb Network. I also coordinate the Virginia Beginning Farmer and Rancher Coalition, and I'm welcome you all, welcoming you all here today on behalf of a number of project partners, including Penn State, Penn State, NC State, and the Appalachian Beginning Forest Farmer Coalition. I'm just going to get us started off with some technical logistics. And then I'll pass it on to our host for today. First, you'll notice that your line is automatically muted and your video is not enabled. That's because this is a Zoom webinar instead of a Zoom meeting. And the main way you can interact with us tonight is through the chat feature. You can enter comments there and also through the Q&A feature where you can add your questions. And we ask that you put your questions specifically in the Q&A so we can better keep track of them and make sure we can answer them. We also wanna let you know that there's live captioning available. There are machine live captions and you can view them by clicking the CC icon at the bottom of your Zoom pane. You can view them as subtitles or as a full transcript. So we invite you to use that if that's helpful. We also wanna let you know that the session is being recorded today and it will be archived on the Appalachian Beginning Forest Farmer Coalition's website. And I wanna invite you if you're having any technical difficulties to please contact me in the chat Katie Trazo, or you can email me at ketrazo at vt.edu. And this is just a, a quick shout out to all the folks in the background helping us today. We have Stesha Warren and Margaret Bloomquist, and they're putting all these messages in the chat right now. So thank you both for helping to move along this session today. And I just want to briefly introduce the Forest Farming in Focus webinar series. It's a series of five webinars we're hosting this winter focused on different non-timber forest products and really doing a deeper dive into how to forest farm them. So looking at species, topics, and practices. If you notice you're missing some of the fundamental information, we have put together learning modules on each topic on our website, and we'll put that in the chat as well. And um, those are just a lot of our basic resources all bundled into one place. So we encourage you to check that out. Our session today is the third one in our series, and it's forest farming fungi. And we have Hannah Hemmelgarn of the University of Missouri here hosting the session. And I'll introduce Hannah really briefly, and then I'll pass it on to her uh, to open our session and introduce our speakers. So Hannah is an assistant program director for the University of Missouri's Center for Agroforestry. Her work is focused on connecting agroforestry research with education and practice also growing networks of learning exchange and creating supportive infrastructure for agroforestry on the ground. She coordinates the center's forest grown mushroom cultivation demonstrations and workshops. She's also an, an avid wild foods forager and she's practiced home scale fungi for, farming for more than a decade. You can hear her on the agroforestry podcast and you can also find many other agroforestry educational material materials at the Center for Agroforestry. So we encourage you to check them out as well. I'm gonna pass it on to Hannah and Hannah will give you a bit of an overview of our session today and introduce our speakers. Yeah, thank you, Katie. It's really an honor to be part of this series. The first two I've attended have been wonderful. And I am delighted to share this space with our panelists this evening. First, we'll hear from Trad Cotter, who is probably a familiar name for the mycophiles attending. Chad Cotter is a microbiologist, a professional mycologist, and an organic gardener. 
Trout has been tissue culturing, collecting native fungi, and cultivating both commercially and experimentally for more than 20 years now. In 1996, he co-founded Mushroom Mountain based in Greenville, South Carolina, which he operates with Olga Katek to explore industrial applications for mushrooms. They currently maintain over 300 species of fungi for food production, mycoremediation, and natural alternatives to chemical pesticides. Chad is author of the very popular book, Organic Mushroom Farming and Mycoremediation, right here. And this is one that I recommend at every, every workshop I host. It's great. Chad has been widely recognized for his important work and among other exciting endeavors, his current research is focused on bacterial interactions with fungi and novel antibiotic discoveries, among other things. Um, so we'll spend the first 40 minutes with Trad Cotter and then we'll transition to um, hear from Rick Fellum Lee, um, who along with his wife and partner Jan own and operate May Apple Farms, which is a small diversified forest farm in Muskingum County, Ohio. They produce forest crops like ramps, ginseng, and other native woodland plants, plus a variety of mushrooms and more conventional produce crops like berries, garlic, and chili peppers. They are lifelong residents of the area and they're committed to improving the local food system through sustainable organic agriculture and or educational outreach. So thank you both for being here. <clears throat> Once they have both presented, um, we will have just a few questions to get us started and then we'll save plenty of time at the end. It'll, it won't feel like plenty of time, um, but there will be a little bit of time at the end for audience questions um, before we close for the night. So with that, Trad, if you are ready to begin, I think we're ready for you. Yeah, let me just share the screen and uh, can you hear me okay, Hannah? I just wanna say too that uh, Steve Yerio here tonight, um, he, he uh, got some, uh, some stuff going on and, and uh, I'm really good friends with Steve and he's taught me a lot. <laughs> Him and I are like peanut butter and and chocolate. So um, I'll, I have learned a lot of these techniques from him. So um, if you're tuning in and um, unfortunately, but hey, you're dealing with me. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. We'll also be sharing resources in the chat, including yeah. some from Cor the Cornell Small Farms Program, where Steve works um, on, with specialty mushrooms. So thank you for that mention. Yeah, man. Sorry, I'm speaking Jamaican all of a sudden. <laughs> okay, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Trad Cotter. I found a mushroom mountain and I've been growing mushrooms um, a long time. I, I think it's going on 30 years. And um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about forest farming fungi and mushrooms. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on uh, the basics of, of forest farming, like shiitake logs. That's been, you know, we've been there, we've done that. I'm going to cover some other cool stuff um, that's that's going on in the forest, All right? But uh, I do want to give a brief introduction um, to that, and that if you are growing mushrooms before, um, I'm going to do a little bit of an intro, and then we're going to get into some really really cool stuff. You know, some 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 different things and options for forest farming of fungi. Uh, mushrooms don't produce spores, uh, seeds; they produce spores. You know, they germinate. Let me find my little laser pointer here. I always like this technology. And yeah, <laughs> spores, mushrooms produce millions of spores. They germinate and they form mycelium. Mycelium is what spawn is. All right, so when you buy spawn, this is what you're getting is mated mycelium. That's what you're going to uh, introduce to a food source uh, wherever you're going to produce these mushrooms, all right? Um, if you want to identify a mushroom, uh, this is a good idea. If you've never grown mushrooms in a forest, especially on a forest floor, I would encourage that you uh, learn how to identify mushrooms. I give classes on this. Um, we can talk about it later in the panel, but this is a spore print and every mushroom has a very unique spore print color, right? So it's really not a good idea uh, to use spores to inoculate the woods because there's so much competition you want to use mycelium all right but learning how to take a spore print that that every mushroom has a different spore print color is a is a good skill because i mean how how many of you are comfortable picking mushrooms out of the forest out of the forest floor right 
And just like weeds in the garden, you could be growing mushrooms you want, and then there'd be mushrooms that just show up, all right? So uh, it's a good idea to know a little bit about mushroom identification if you are growing mushrooms in the forest. Uh, this is a uh, microscope slide of, of spores germinating. You see the little tube. This one's reaching out to this one. This is like a nightclub here. Um, this one's <laughs> asking this one out to dance or whatever you want to call it. And they mate and then they fuse and then they become uh, mycelium. You can also use Q-tips uh, on dark spored mushrooms if you want to take a spore print. You can rake the pores or gills. Uh, that comes in handy for ID. So this is what mycelium is. This is what will become a mushroom later. Uh, mushrooms are, this is what mycelium looks like in our micrograph and they're hot. Mushrooms produce heat, carbon dioxide, and they sweat and they drill their way through the environment. Uh, they use enzymes uh, to break down their environment and they, they basically combust molecules. They break them apart and then they absorb them right through their cell walls. And they're also predatory on different organisms, like even bacteria. So there's a lot going on in the soil uh, and mushrooms are critical for uh, ecosystems. So it's just fascinating. Uh, one cool thing I threw in there because I thought it was cool was that mushrooms uh, too are capable of carrying and entrapping nematodes. Uh, they produce um, these snares. There's sticky knobs and in inflatable snares and uh, the nematodes stick their heads through there and tails and get trapped and then and then the uh, the fungi inflate these these things and then they dissolve the nematode and they use them as a nitrogen source so man there's a lot going out <laughs> there's a lot going on in the soil isn't there all right don't come back as a nematode in the forest <laughs> the fungi will get you uh, mycorrhizal fungi, I want to talk about that for a minute. These are near and dear to me, and I'm, I'm learning more about this. Uh, I, I took a class down at University of Florida uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, these are fungi that associate with plants and trees. So this is a great um, segment for anyone who wants to grow plants that are hard to propagate, especially forest plants like ginseng and cohosh and stuff like that. Um, there are fungi that bond to the root systems of these plants. And if you are trying to propagate those plants, um, there's a way to harvest that mycelium to seed start or use for inoculating of the area where you, let's say, where you're gonna transplant or plant ginseng later, okay? So these are fungi that associate with um, the plants. They may or may not produce mushrooms, but they grow on the root hairs of the plant. So if, if you were saying, let's um, hypothetically, let's say this is a, a, a ginseng or cohosh plant, and this is mycorrhizae, you see it here, and it can pick up some native mycorrhizae. So if you find some native uh, ginseng or cohosh, you could place a little bag of soil or a little mound of soil right next to it, a couple high, and the roots of that plant will go up into that soil and you could actually harvest, let's say you put a little mound right here. Um, we'll do it right here with a pen. Let's say if this was your, your, your plant and you just put a little mound of soil here, you know, all the way around like a, like a tree ring. And then you could, you could come back and the roots of this plant will go up into the soil with the mycorrhizae and then you could come with a shovel and just take this away and use this as a seed starting mix to inoculate the next one. Does that make sense? It's, it's an awesome technique. And uh, this is going in my new book, so I don't have pictures yet, but uh, we've been doing this with, with several plants. Uh, mycorrhizae have been around for a long time. It, 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 it hasn't changed 400 million years um, and it's in the fossil record. Uh, they've got it right the first time. Well, maybe not the first time. <laughs> um, uh, um, fossil fuel, fuel derived uh, fertilizers are not good, all right, for mycorrhizal relationships. If you use um, mined phosphate, then basically what happens is in, in parts per billions, the fungi don't associate with the root plants of those, of those plants or trees. So if you're forest farming, um, like ginseng, cohosh, other or other understory plants for forest farming and are using artificial 
fertilizers, this is damaging, this is no good. They're not allowing the fungi to associate with the root systems of these plants. So you gotta lay off of that. Um, you really have to try to see if you can um, propagate native mycorrhizae from native populations or wild populations of the plants that you collect, because this is a symptom of conventional agriculture, right? <laughs> uh, fertilize, spray, dead soil, you know, addicted to all that. And, and that's, not what's, that's not what we want. What we want in those mycorrhizal relationships in a forest are this, is this carbon trading. We want them to associate, the plants to associate uh, and, and allow this fungus to enter the cells of, those, uh, of the roots because there's 30% more nitrogen up to 60% more phosphate with those roots. This is a big deal, right? So this is not forest farming fungi for food or medicine, or this is fungi that are associating with the plants in the forest, right? So we have to understand how, how to propagate these. And it's very simple. Soil, a little mound of potting soil around uh, or, or native soil around the root system of plants that you want to propagate, um, you can harvest that. And then you could use that with your next uh, transplantation, right? There's different types of mycorrhizae. There's ectomycorrhizae uh, and, and, and essentially there's endomycorrhizal too that associate with annuals and perennials. Uh, now you can buy mixes of this stuff, but what I'm telling you is that it makes more sense um, to cultivate bioregional fungi that grow in your area that have associated with the plant in the first place. Where have you isolated this, this plant, right? Harvest those mycorrhizae and use it in your transplantation, right? It's kind of like a, <laughs> I hate to say it, but it's kind of like a fecal transplant for humans, but it's a transplant. It's a mycorrhizal transplant for the plants at the same time. These are the microbes. Uh, it's not just the fungus, it's the bacteria and also that are involved. Um, you know, the, we have native truffles here. They grow in our woods here. They grow on pecans, they grow on oaks, you know, and, and all these have associations, not only plants with fungi, but with bacteria, right? And other microbes. It is multiple levels of biology going on here. So if you want to successfully cultivate natives, in uh, a forest ecosystem, you have to think about all those levels of biology that they're used to uh, when they're wild, right? I'm gonna breeze through log and stump cultivation because uh, I want really cool stuff. Uh, typically, uh, shiitake cultivation, right, is uh, grown with spawn, and these are fresh cut logs, drilled, plugged. All right, we drill it. They're fresh cut because nothing else has gotten the wood. You drill a hole, and this is for a lot of other mushrooms, right? So I'm gonna show the shiitake mushroom, and then we're gonna go on to a lot of other different mushrooms here. So you drill the log around the bark, about an inch deep. You can insert mm, plug spawn, sawdust spawn, doesn't matter. And then you uh, drill it, wax it, and then you wait. Right, you just leave them outside, you water them occasionally, and then uh, all of a sudden you can see, uh, like this log down here, you see the end starting to turn white. And then right here, you see that the mycelium is cold or it is taken over this log. Mushrooms don't fruit until they run out of space or they feel threatened. And uh, so then it reaches the end of this log. Now it's thinking, I need to fruit, I need to produce a mushroom. So if you take those logs, soak them in a couple, couple days, then it takes six to eight months to colonize a log, and then you can start to produce mushrooms, like these shiitakes that are coming out, all right? So um, I'm gonna switch to uh, stump cultivation. Yeah, if you uh, fell trees for shiitake logs, now you have the stump left behind, hmm. you might as well inoculate it. You could also, with some of the logs, make artificial stumps. And you can inoculate those with lion's mane and, and different mushrooms in the woods. So one of the first ones, it's not an edible mushroom, it could be uh, a, a medicinal mushroom market, which is the reishi mushroom. So these are logs that are drilled and plugged and, and colonized 
plow and they just put them in a uh, on the forest floor and cover them with dirt or mulch and then they put this little tunnel over the top now you don't have to have this tunnel um, this is from china and japan uh, they use these little tunnels for for uh, humidity tents right they cut little holes the mushrooms come up you don't have to at all and the mushrooms pop up in the spring so if you were to inoculate logs with reishi, let's say in the spring of this year, and then bury them in the fall, then, the, then you'll have mushroom production like this in the spring. It's a spring starter, right? So, um, uh, maitake is also another mushroom that benefits from being buried. It grows from buried wood. This is a mushroom that fruits right at the base of very large oaks that are in decline. So how do you, how do you mimic that, All right? It grows off the dead wood, the base of the tree and the roots that extend beyond this oak in the Southeast. So what you're gonna need to do is drill and plug small oak rounds, and then you could just bury them in the forest and then up pop little um, maitake mushrooms. This is a wild one. It was on a huge tree. Look at that, it weighs 13.8 pounds. <laughs> You're not gonna get something like that off of a small round. So this is off of a cultivated um, a round. You can see the wood here, uh, very small. So we, we buried the wood halfway into the ground and then we get these very beautiful small clusters of maitake, like you see here. All right, so maitake or hen of the woods, it's got a very good market value. Um, it's got the highest, levels of vitamin D of any cultivated mushroom. It's off the charts. It's a, it's a wonderful edible. I think it's on my top two. And I kind of teeter back and forth from morels and maitake. It just really depends on <laughs> what's in the pan that night. You know, it's really good. Um, it's really good mushroom. Here's another one at the base of a tree. So yeah, so buried wood species like maitake and reishi have uh, reishi, Maybe you can make some tinctures out of that because it's not an edible mushroom, but a maitake mushroom is marketable, right? And if you, you don't have to, if you don't want to dig holes and bury these little, you know, tiny rounds of oaks that you inoculate, you can just lay them on the ground and bring soil or mulch over the top of them and it's going to do the same thing. They just need to be buried, right? In something. Um, chicken... I would say, uh, I, I put this up because a lot of people think, oh, well, I want to grow chicken in the woods, in the woods, you know, maybe commercially. Eek. You know, uh, this mushroom is um, not a reliable fruiter, right? So, I mean, you could drill and plug down trees. It likes really large pieces of oak. So if you do have a very large down tree, maybe in a, a storm or something like that, um, you can drill and plug um, your, that tree with, uh, chicken of the woods, but I wouldn't be so, so hopeful about yields or expectations here. So, you know, if you have a tree down, it's worth a shot. Inoculate it with chicken of the woods, you know, but not a production species in the woods. Uh, mushroom I, uh, I like is growing on mulch in the woods, and we get hardwood mulch from uh, tree companies and power line companies, and I just have the gate open. I'd say, listen, if the gate, gate is open and you have uh, gone through a series of hardwood uh, clearings in, in the power lines, just bring all the hardwood to me. And, and then they drop it and we can put this out in the woods, right along the trails. Uh, you can also use this right along the edge of the forest, you know, right along the drip lines because mushrooms are interface dwellers. They like they like to be right at the edge of where the, the leaves hang down. They don't like to fruit right up under the trees, right up near the trunks. They like to be out on the edge. And next time you're out in the wild or on a farm or on the edge of a forest, look, look and see and notice how tall the grass is right near the edge, right near the drip line. That's where they're, they're getting water. That's where a mushroom wants to be, all right? So positioning these little forest gardens um, can, be, um, can be a lot of fun. You know, you can look and see where the drip lines are, the trees, and you can place these little mushroom gardens here. Like this one was right off of a, the north side of a tree line, and we put down some cardboard, 
and we added some King Stropharia, right, to suppress some of the weeds. And then we added mulch, and then we started doing this in the forest. Um, this was on our trail at uh, Mushroom Mountain. We took recycled engine crates, uh, hardwood crates, and just filled them with wood chips and inoculate them with King Stropharia. And it, it, it was absolutely wonderful. Just a, such an easy mushroom to grow. King Stropharia grows in the um, fall and the spring. But remember, it needs time to colonize those wood chips, right? So if you do it summer or late summer, it might not have enough time to colonize by the time the temperature drops and fruit in the fall. So then it skips and then goes, yeah, I'm gonna fruit in the spring or the following fall. So if you want King Stropharia in the fall this year, uh, March, April, May, maybe up to June might be your window. You know, after that, it might not have time. This is an easy uh, mushroom to identify. It's a black spore. And for every inch of mulch depth, this is awesome. <laughs> I love it. Every inch of mulch depth, you probably are going to get an inch in cap diameter. So if you make your beds, one to two inches deep, you're going to get little, you know, one to two inch wide uh, King Stropharia. I'll show you one in a minute. This one was in an eight to nine inch bed. It was deep. So I got these huge, wide King Stropharias, all right? Um, now, if you're mulching this around your garden, you can do this in the garden out in the sun, but I'm saying, but in the forest, you can go deep, you know, six, nine, 10 inches deep. You can get a mushroom that resembles a portobello out there. Beautiful mushroom. You know, you could grill that one. You could dip it in oil, vinaigrette, and then grill it. Mm. It's almost dinner time. You got to stop. So uh, this is one that naturalized in the front yard. It just showed up. And this is a native mushroom to the southeast. So it knows the area. Um, and uh, it loves hard wood. So, you know, oak, maple, cherry, ash, beech, birch. Pecan, if you're up north, <laughs> if you're down south, pecan. I hope somebody got that joke. All right. Um, in the forest also um, is a wonderful mushroom called the bluet. I love it. Um, it's a winter fruiting mushroom and uh, it, it thrives on a cold snap, but it likes, it doesn't like wood chips. It likes the lignin rich, which is the barky material. It also likes leaves or composted leaves that are partially decomposed, All right? So this is a great mushroom to put out um, in the woods, mulching around, um, you know, e even plants like, like, you know, not like ginger, but uh, ginseng and cohosh and plants like this, you, you can actually mulch through the forest, create soil and produce these beautiful lavender mushrooms that are silky and sweet. Uh, bluets are, traditionally foraged for, but uh, this one can be cultivated and, and they can grow in very large numbers. So if you put a uh, little rows of, of leaf litter out there and then you spawn it with, uh, with bluets and even compost from your garden or your kitchen waste, they love it. They love a very complex soil and this one fruits and it's triggered by bacteria. So it's gonna fruit in the forest. Right, this is not something that you can grow indoors, you know, like oyster mushrooms and, and things like that on an indoor operation. This is an exclusively woodland mushroom. Now, once the mushrooms are done, just understand that in a forest ecosystem, um, mushrooms create octanol and they attract different organisms. So that, that's a different benefit. Uh, farming in the forest is that these fungi are attracting organisms that break the mycelium down using a chemo attractant called octanol and they turn it back into soil. And that's what we need in these forest ecosystems or, or things like worms and other organisms is making soil, you know, quality soil because worm castings are rich in, in uh, natural fertilizers and bacteria that are symbiotic with the rhizosphere of, of these native plants. So now you can forget the fertilizer. So you have mushroom compost in the forest. You can line these mushroom beds next to uh, productive plant systems. 
right, that are, uh, that are in the forest, that are plants, and then they would fertilize them right next to them. So positioning these mushroom beds near plant systems, that's a great idea because you've got mycorrhizae in there uh, on your plants. You've got mushroom beds right next to it, leaching out and feeding these uh, mycorrhizae root systems that are reaching up into the mushroom bed and harvesting nutrients and, and everything for the plant. It's wonderful. So I love uh, interkingdom interactions, you know, animals, fungi and bacteria. That's what kind of my brain went <laughs> lately. And uh, so this is a typical white button mushroom, just like you buy in the store or a portabella cross section, just so you understand how this works. And then I'll show you how to grow another species in the woods here. So this section here, uh, right through there, this is all nutritive. This is straw, compost and manure, things like this. This is non-nutritive. So this is non-nutritive here. This is a casing soil. Ah, I need my damn pointer. I need my drawing stick. That's non-nutritive. So this is a casing soil here, non-nutritive, and then it's full of bacteria. So you have bacteria, it colonizes this, it grows up through this, and then your mushrooms form. All right, some mushrooms need that, and they'll get it in a forest ecosystem. So this is something that was cased. There's mushrooms down below, and then we added a, a non-nutritive casing soil on top. And then all of a sudden, it's out reaching out, it fans out, it's looking for microbes. It's looking for something to trigger it to fruit. And that is in your native soil, in the forest, right? So whenever I pick a mushroom like this one, this is a King Strafaria. I showed that earlier. What I would do is uh, I would harvest this. Your mushroom is up here. You could save that and eat it, but I save it. And what I do is I uh, put these stem bases in a blender with a little bit of distilled water or rainwater, not city water, because that will kill the bacteria. So I, I like to use spring water, put it in a blender, put the stem bases in there, blast them up, make a slurry, and then I go back out to those mushroom beds and I drizzle it over the top of the mushroom bed. And now you have all the players on the field. Does that make sense? That mushroom, this one, on these bundles of mycelium, are loaded with bacteria that caused it to fruit. So this is like an epoxy set. So even if you make a mushroom bed and you have like one mushroom fruit, that's great. You know, it might not have had the microbes all the way through the bed. So pick that mushroom, cut off the stem base, make a slurry, and then rebroadcast and soak that bed with the bacteria that that one mushroom found and I guarantee you, it's going to trigger all that mycelium that grow through there to produce more. So one of the mushrooms that does that, and uh, I learned this method from Mark Jones up in uh, uh, Virginia, and he's growing these almond portobellas out in beds. This is out in the bed in the forest. Now, these prefer uh, compost. You can use um, livestock manure that uh, where you it's been composted where you cannot smell the ammonia, all right? So if you're using chicken or turkey litter, um, it's gotta be very well composted. If it's horse manure, cow manure, it's quicker. Um, if you can smell ammonia, don't use it. So all you need to do is take this, put it in a row out in the woods. Uh, in the spring, this one is a, a tropical mushroom. So it's gonna start fruiting around 75 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you put it in uh, late April, May in the Southeast US uh, or wherever, wherever you are, uh, this one uh, does not like the cold and it's gonna fruit about 60 days later and it'll fruit about every two to three weeks, uh, maybe two to three flushes out in the woods. All right, what you can do, which is a good idea is you can take this soil and put it near plants that you want to propagate. Do you remember how to cultivate mycorrhizae? You put the soil right next to the plant. So you grow the mushrooms next to the plant. The, the roots of a plant go up into the mushroom bed. And then after the almond portobello 
is done, you can just shave up the almond portobello bed, and now you've collected mycorrhizae for the plant, for the plant propagation. So you can just flip that over to another location in the forest. So using the mushroom beds as a means of attracting the mycorrhizal associations with the plants that you're gonna plant later. So everybody just kind of moves through the forest. Uh, another mushroom that's not mycorrhizal, it's saprophytic, but it's one that, uh, it's a heat tolerant mushroom. It only fruits above 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 80 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is a good mushroom to grow in the summer. Um, and this is one that we carry. This is a patty straw. It's, uh, it's, it's native here. It's heavily propagated in Asia. And uh, this one has up to 42% protein dry weight. It's an amazing mushroom. I love it. Now, this one, I could not cultivate for years. And I couldn't figure it out because I was not thinking like a mushroom. <laughs> I was thinking like, hey, I could just grow this and it's, you know, pasteurize this and it should grow out of this. Well, it didn't work out that way. Um, we dumped a bunch of leftover spawn into a compost pile and then it fruited. So then this mushroom taught me what to do. You know, I was watching it. So what did we grow it on? Spent oyster mushroom substrate from our indoor operation. So we went out here, you see the woods out here. Uh, it loves shade. I wouldn't do this in the full sun, but we just laid down some plastic here, uh, double long, this is doubled over. And then we just laid down, there's stripes, and then this band is spent oyster mushroom substrate. So it alternates like you see here. So that's, that's another spent oyster here, spent oyster in between there and in between this one. And this is just wet straw. And then we inoculated it with sawdust spawn and watch this. And then we just took this tarp uh, plastic, covered it like a humidity tent. <clears throat> we had patty straw in 10 days, 10 days. All right. The reason we use the plastic out there and it's reusable is because this mushroom has what? It's got a vulva. The deadliest mushroom in North America has a vulva, right? So you don't wanna grow these on the forest floor if you're a beginner, because if I didn't use this plastic and these, uh, that's a pine, but let's say there's some oak trees around here and all this was sitting on the ground, in theory, you could have deadly mushrooms popping up through this bed, couldn't you, right? Hmm. So with the plastic, it eliminates all that if you're not good with ID, but it also preserves moisture. You can water it and flood this area with some water and it works really good. So this is a very low tech uh, way of fruiting patty straw in a forest or understory ecosystem, right? Yeah, you could do this on the forest floor if you are good at mushroom ID, right? Or a big compost pile on the forest edge. But what a wonderful mushroom. I love it. It's one of my favorites. Um, it's really good. I'm always going to say a mushroom is my favorite, by the way. <laughs> All right, I got 10 more minutes. I got something cool coming up. Um, and, and just so you know, uh, King Stropharia is also triggered by bacteria. Uh, I added this as a bonus because I saw it was cool. Um, this was growing on pasteurized straw and um, and you can do this in the forest as well. You can just dig a trench or build a mound of pasteurized straw, just like you would oyster mushrooms. Hmm? Make, a, make a line of pasteurized straw, inoculate it with King Stropharia, cover it with a tarp, let it turn white, cover it with a casing soil, and then you have King Stropharia, not months later, but weeks later, all right? So watch this, from this slide to the next slide is only a, it's only two days. So from here to here, that's two days of growth, all right? Let's do it again. <laughs> I, don't, I don't see enough reaction out there. Two days, ready? One, two, three, boom. <laughs> that's amazing. Right? And if you've never grown mushrooms before, I mean, I've been doing this for 40 years, legally for 26, and 
I mean, it's mushrooms are awesome. Um, I did want to touch on agritourism too, like in these forests. Uh, this is Mushroom Mountain. So we have kiosks like this. Uh, all there's one here, there's one here. It's a good idea to, I mean, listen, you're going to plant your beds anyway. And if you're trying to encourage people to visit your farm um, and you can make mushroom beds out here uh, around these kiosks and little information signs like this, I think we have like 30 of these around the trail. And we haven't yet shot the video for the QR codes, but there is a ton of information here about that mushroom. And it talks about edibility, right? Uh, cultivation, fruiting season, all these cool things. And visitors just come out and they walk our trail. Even we're open, you know, not doing a farm tour. They walk the trail, they're bound to see something cool. If you put some signs out there um, and we leave this trail open for visitors. And then we also charge for tours later. If we, you know, a walkthrough tour to interpret the trail and the indoor and the lab operation, right? Um, our our, tour, our tours are sold out all the time. So think about that. People want to know about mushrooms. They want to see what they're doing. They're curious. Um, alternative products to mushrooms. We're gonna talk about this in the panel. I know Rick's got some stuff going on. Uh, powders, uh, medicinal extracts. Well, we started that at Mushroom Mountain several years ago. That's doing really, really well. Um, uh, soaps, lotions, cosmetics, microbrewery. Uh, I started making mushroom beer like, <laughs> like 10 years ago. That's a big deal, actually. That's blowing up like crazy. And then just dream up your own products. You know, um, those mushrooms can be dried and powdered and used in just about anything, right? Skincare, lotion. Oh dear, I thought I thought I had some morel slides. Hold on a second. Give me give me two seconds. One of the moderators, come on and chat for a second. <laughs> I'm gonna pull up some slides real quick. I need like five more minutes. We have a lot of people posting questions in the chat. If you missed any reminders that those should go in the Q&A area, be sure to copy whatever your ideas were from the chat and repost them in the Q&A. There are tons of questions in the Q&A and we won't get to all of them, but I know that some of our other helpers on hand will try to address those um, with a typed response if we don't have time for all of them. Okay, I'm getting ready to just share right now. I don't know what happened there, but. Okay, uh, I wanna end it with something really cool is that, um, uh, morel season is upon us. <laughs> How many of you know what morels are, right? And so I wrote a chapter in my book on uh, outdoor cultivation of morels. And um, I, I think that uh, this, this definitely needs to be looked into because uh, this is a perfect forest farming mushroom for this area. So um, uh, Janine, you and I got to talk. <laughs> you and I got to talk, seriously. Because um, in China, they're actually growing these uh, outdoors in cold frames, uh, which could be done in a forest ecosystem. Uh, so this is acreage under roof in China. This was in 2016. That's 20, 23,000 acres. Now it's up to 100,000 acres of morale production. So what, what they do is they grow this on native soil, and they have just a cold frame. So just like a humidity tent, just like we would could do in our woods with reach uh, around host trees. And then they would, um, my laser pointer is not working again. They would spawn the native soil, which really is a nutritive. So it starves to death, but it, it colonizes a little bit. And then they add these bags, which are nutritive. 
These are filled with grain and straw that are perforated underneath. Then the morels go up into the bags, mine what they want, and translocate it back into that native soil, and then the morels fruit. And I've seen a couple people do this, right? Um, even without a cold frame. It's an interesting concept. All right, so um, I do have an alternative to this that some people are using. Again, um, this is just extremely experimental, but um, I think we're at the moment of understanding that this is possible. Farming morels in the forest like this, like, like rows of corn, all right, could be very lucrative, very interesting. Now, this is, a, this is a mushroom that is also microbial dependent, all right? Uh, now, some of these strains are, are, are uh, very unique that they're using, and we've got some of the strains, the same strains from Penn State send, sent us strains. So we have about five or six different morel strains that, that, that could be used for potentially farming these things, all right? So anyway, that's, I thought that was exciting. It was something to look forward to. Um, and uh, morel season is uh, coming. Unfortunately, there's a frost and a freeze coming <laughs> this weekend. But I've, I found about 50 morels two days ago, and that's probably all I'm going to get this year because it's there, there's a freeze coming. Um, so here's how you do it in the woods. This is from my book. Morels produce spores. They germinate. Um, in my book, I, I do say that, yeah, you can buy uh, morel cultures, but it makes more sense to find a morel in your area and you can take uh, a morel and the spores and stick it in water and you make a slurry out of it, stick it in your fridge and it makes a biofilm, like a, almost like kombucha. And you have the fungus and all the bacteria there on the plate that you need. So then you would take that and inoculate your bed. But here's what happens. If you spawn something and then they look for food, they're starving, then they translocate their food back up to the soil surface. And then you get freezing and flooding, which is good. You need a certain amount of freezing for this to happen, right? You're not gonna do this in South Florida. You know, so you have to have chill hours, uh, six inches deep, 200 plus, chill hours freezing per year, you know, for that, for that to happen. And then they're going to turn back into morels from that, from that resting structure called a sclerotia. So morels are interesting, right? And in the woods, just so you see, we did this in the lab where we did, this is non-nutritive. So this is your native soil. This is nutritive. This is where they're getting their food. We put a morel culture in the middle and it, it mined all the resources from this side and look at all the little sclerotia it produced. So where does it fruit? Where there is no nutrition, where it's starving to death, all right? So we did this in the lab. We uh, inoculated nutritive, it starved to death. We cased it, this is a casing soil. And look what we have up here at the top. We've got morel sclerotia producing just as it would in the wild. So let's move this into a real scenario. Uh, you dig a trench here, maybe some, um, that's, my, that's my timer going off saying I have two minutes. So you have um, identify what the host trees are in your forest ecosystem. So down here for me, it's gonna be ash trees. I would look for ash trees. I maybe dig a little trench or build a little mound, dig it out. Put your nutritive layer in here, which could be sawdust, you know, some wheat bran, just, just some food. And the non-nutritive layer, which could be uh, the native soil you, you dug out, you could actually put it back on top. It'll probably mound over. And then you sprinkle your morel spawn here because you don't want it to touch, you don't want it to touch the nutritive layer or it's not gonna work. It's only gonna work if your spawn your morel spawn comes into contact with no food. It's going to drill its way down, starving. It's going to hit the gold mine, and then it's going to come back and produce your sclerotia up top. So that's how you would forest farm morels as far as anybody knows it right now. 
which I think is really exciting. So I, if anybody's watching, uh, try that. There's a good chapter in my book on how to make a morel slurry from uh, just a morel that you find. And I would highly recommend that you would uh, not buy morel mycelium, but make your own from a speed, from one that is found in your area. Buy a region specific, right? I sell morel spawn and I'm telling you not to buy it. How about that? <laughs> it makes more sense. So this could be you next year. <laughs> I don't know. I hope it was me. I wish I picked that many. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna stop share and I'll put up my contact information real quick again. Uh, that's it right there. And so, uh, yeah, that's this is what I do on Friday nights, right? Cut out shapes and mushrooms. I like to watch the happiness grow. Um, and I know we're not done talking, but I wanna thank you in advance for coming tonight. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and that's uh, our website, mushroommountain.com. If you need morel spawn, just kidding. <laughs> uh, but we have all kind. We have 350 different species of mushrooms there uh, and cultures. And if you have any questions, you can uh, contact us through the web page. And there's my book again, because I know Hannah has it, right? <laughs> she held it up. Yeah, and um, you know that there have been a lot of questions posted in the Q and A, and um, the answers to many of those questions are in this book. And some of the other resources that have been posted in the chat. So, um, Chad, if you want to start looking through some of those to address some of the basic ones, that's great. Um, and folks should be able to see those answers also. If you had the same question, you want to hmm. discuss that. So well, here, here's, here's a disturbing yeah. thought no questions. Have a good night. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, I'm going to start here and I'll give it over to Rick. All right. Thank you. Yeah, Rick, whenever you're ready to start. Get him, Rick. All right, thank you all. Uh, my name is Rick Bellamy, uh, and it's great to hear from you, Trad. I would also recommend Trad's book. It's it's my, one of my go-to resources um, as we've been kind of growing and learning with our own mushroom business. So, um, just tell you a little bit about us. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. So our uh, business is called Mayapple Farms. We are in Dresden, Ohio. Like I said, we, we, it's a very small uh, family-owned farm that we run with uh, my, my wife, Jan, and I, and, and our two kids, Elijah and Emma. This grew out of a hobby. Um, we've always had an interest in growing. Um, we've always had a garden for ourselves. Um, kind of branched out a little bit, maybe around 2014, and started experimenting with growing ginseng in the woods, some other woodland plants and kind of started the idea of maybe turning that into a business at some point. So a few years later, we um, started officially in 2017. Um, we use a bit of a hybrid approach. We do a lot of forest farming, um, a lot of outdoor mushrooms on logs. We also sell pre-inoculated pre mushroom logs at, at the farmer's market. Um, we're lucky to have a large patch of wild ramps that we harvest from selectively every year. And we also grow a lot of the forest botanicals, the understory plants that Trad mentioned, like uh, ginseng, golden seal, black cohosh, blue cohosh, et cetera. Um, so we combine those forest farming aspects of our business with kind of more conventional market gardening. It's not really quite full farm scale, but we do grow some more conventional produce. Um, we grow mushrooms indoors also year round. Uh, we grow a variety of berries and perennial fruit crops, um, garlics and chili peppers, and we've ex experimented the last few years growing ginger and turmeric as well, which is, has been working out for us. Um, right now, we're primarily selling at farmer's markets. We do have some other channels that we use kind of on a limited basis, but um, we're really focused on kind of local farmer's markets right now, getting out, building our brand, um, building our customer base. And it also allows us, because we're small, to capture more of a premium price, um, you know, at the markets as opposed to different wholesale avenues. We'll start <clears throat> talking a little bit about our forest farming um, part briefly. You can see it's kind of divided into a combination of plants and, and different mushrooms. Um, 
starting from the top left, we have a small outdoor nursery where we propagate some of the forest crops like the ginseng you see there in the middle top. Um, you can see the ramps, a large wild patch of ramps that we have and maintain. We take those just in small amounts to the farmer's market every year. And then on the upper right, we also, that's a bed of uh, native plants that we plant and sell kind of as um, planting stock. And um, that's something we're just getting into and seems to be promising for us. And so we combine that with the uh, with the, the mushrooms that you can see along the bottom. Of course, the log grown shiitakes. We also grow lion's mane and bear's head on totems, uh, reishis on logs there, like Trad had mentioned. That was a wonderful uh, little display there he had. Um, the ones uh, the second from the right on the bottom. Those are olive oysterling, a little less common, um, also known as mukataki. And then on the bottom right are the red wine caps that you can see there. We um, combine again with market gardening. So the forest farming is part of our business. Um, that's kind of the longer term part of our business along with a lot of those plants have long growth cycles. So we combine that with more traditional market gardening like uh, we grow crops like you know traditional garlics, a lot of varieties of garlic some berries, um, you can see some ginger growing there in the top right, and we grow a big variety of chili peppers as well. The uh, market gardening does a couple things for us, um, just as the overall look at our farm. Um, it gives us some summertime crops, not a lot of our outdoor mushrooms grow then. It gives us some diversity in our crops and it adds some color and interest to our tables um, as well, during, you know, at the markets. So we also combine that with indoor mushrooms um, in the middle there is just to look at our grow room. That was kind of when it was still a little bit under construction. And then some, it's a small space, maybe, um, I think it's about eight, eight foot across by 12 foot deep. So maybe a hundred square feet total. And we're able to cycle about 50 pounds of fresh mushrooms through there on a weekly basis for sale at the markets. Um, <clears throat> you can see some of the varieties here in the top left are traditional oysters, the pearl oysters, piapinis below those on the bottom left, and then going over on the right at the top are some king oysters standing tall and uh, chestnuts there along the bottom as well. One of my personal favorites. Our sales channels, like I mentioned, primarily farmers markets. We do a small collaborative CSA in the winter where we partner with um, some of our farmer friends that um, offer greens and microgreens to add in with our mushrooms throughout the winter. And we do a small amount of wholesale with local restaurants and retailers too. That's primarily as an outlet for our surplus um, products. If we end up with extra in a given week, we have a few channels that we can kind of offload those to at a discount, of course. Um, some other ways, kind of, I guess, unique ways that maybe we've incorporated mushrooms into our business aside from just growing them um, for sale at the markets. We do sell pre-inoculated mushroom logs. Um, shiitakes are of what we've done so far. We're gonna expand that to include chestnut and lion's mane this year. You can see there on the left of the screen, um, we just kind of label them up with a nice label and take those to the farmer's market. It's, it's been a very popular product. Um, the, the main thing is, you know, the patience aspect of it, you gotta make sure and communicate that really clearly to customers. Um, but, um, but yeah, that's been a really good seller for us. It generates a lot of interest and it's more of a shelf stable product, you know, as opposed to the fresh mushrooms that have to kind of move quickly or, or, um, you know, lose, lose their value. And then something we're just launching this year are some kind of curated mushroom hunting kits where we've just put together some, what we consider high quality items into different kits. This one in the middle there is shown for kids and then we've got some tote bags printed to carry it all in. So we're excited to be launching those this year as well. <clears throat> we also forage for wild mushrooms. You can see along the right there, um, nice maitake find we had a couple of years ago and then a beautiful hen of the woods from last fall. So that's a nice addition to our grown mushrooms in the summer. Um, typically what we're looking for here uh, are a lot of the ones Trad mentioned, the morels here starting in four or five weeks. And then as we get into summer um, chanterelle season, really good. Last year it ran from June through September here. So it was very good. 
Um, we also look for uh, chicken of the woods. And then my personal favorite is the hen of the woods. It comes along usually right at the end of summer, uh, beginning of fall around here. And then we also do, we try to do some educational outreach, um, events like this, which thank you all for coming and giving me a chance to be part of this tonight. Um, you can see there on the left, that's from a demonstration we did on log inoculation techniques down at the United uh, Plant Saver Sanctuary last fall for a forest farming conference through rural action. And then we also do um, demonstrations of different types at the local farmers markets we attend. So there in the bottom left is we just harvested a bunch of wild mushrooms last year and took them out and displayed them on a table with guides and kind of ID'd the ones that we could and, and left the others open to questions and left the guides out there for people to just look through and ask questions. And it a, it's, was really popular and generates a lot of interest. So I'll end here um, with my contact information. Um, any additional questions, you're, you're welcome to reach out. Um, otherwise, this will turn it back over to Hannah. And uh... Wonderful, thank you very much, Rick yeah. and Trad for all of the information you've shared. I'm gonna start out with just a, a few big open-ended questions for the two of you, and we'll, we'll be sure to save enough time to address some of the questions in the chat too. So I'm thinking about ways to combine those questions so we can address them all. So the first one I have for you is, you know, thinking about um, the, the interplay between wild systems and forest farming. And, you know, that's, that's a, there's a blurry line there. But I'm curious how your relationships with wild mushrooms have influenced your cultivation practices. So this could be related to how and why certain species are able to be cultivated, or even you know, in a bigger picture integrated forest farming context, what you have learned from those wild systems um, that can help you be in good relationship with forest farm plants and fungi. And fungi. So either of you can start. All right, I'll go, what the hell? <laughs> Somebody has to go. Um, yeah, I mean, so it, it's really, a, it, it's a lot uh insight into when, when you're finding wild mushrooms too i'm a mushroom grower i don't grow plants in the forest yet but after hearing like all this you know going on being a part of this i'm like hmm, yeah i'm gonna do that you know because it makes sense um so you know 10 15 years ago we knew nothing of we grew shiitakes on logs you know and that was it uh, and now we've got all these different species that um can can grow on law be buried and everybody's experimenting with them so um and look at what's happening with morels now you know it's very intriguing and um i, I love getting out there and experimenting with uh different systems uh, especially with the mushrooms and and just um you know that's the only way you can succeed is to fail forward sometimes you know and and a lot of these things have not been done yet but you know sharing all of this information you know and, and i didn't just come up with this stuff by myself i learned it from somebody else and i added my little mojo to it you know and the next everybody listening is going to add their mojo to it and then we're going to get ahead in the game here so uh, i encourage everyone to experiment with um, growing plants uh, and mushrooms together in systems out in the woods you know that's this is uh, you've seen the benefits that i've talked about um with soil creation. And it takes 500 years to make an inch of soil in a healthy ecosystem. If you add mushrooms out there and wood chips, you're gonna get soil in a year, you know? So an inch of soil in a year. Um, and and our, our plants benefit from that. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll end with, uh, I'm a big soil creation person, which plants benefit from. And the upstate South Carolina, the, the top soil was 12 to 15 feet deep 100 years ago, and now it's three to five inches deep. And, uh, and it would take 79,000 years to put that soil back if we left it alone. So we have to let mushrooms, we have to let fungi take over in those ecosystems. And if we can add organic matter and debris, if we can grow mushrooms in a forest and add organic matter and build soil, that's what our plants and trees want. Right. Yeah, I totally agree with everything Trad said there. Um, I think one of the most exciting things is what he referred to early with the uh, mycorrhizal relationships that we're just starting to understand with the, with the forest plants. I know just uh, for a while now, even when we plant, um, you know, fruit trees or berry bushes, 
we'll always just as a matter of practice take a scoop of our native forest soil just to mix in um, you know <clears throat> it's unproven but it certainly couldn't hurt the idea there that it's a way of inoculating the soil around that plant um, to help it get started with the, with the helpful, the beneficial fungus that's there native, because that's going to be the most well adapted, um, as opposed to something you would go out and purchase, like Trad mentioned earlier. So, yeah, to me, the, the mycorrhizal relationship is starting to understand that more and more fully. Um, that's one of the most exciting things for me as far as how it applies to, you know, understanding that relationship more fully between fungus and plants to, you know, make it mutually beneficial. Great. And I'm going to jump around, actually, because there are some related questions in the Q&A. Um, a couple that came up were related to um, if uh, growing cultivated species that are not native to, to a given forest where you are, um, if there is any chance of um, spreading those, those fungi with any detriment. Is there any concern about invasive or aggressive fungi? I mean, I mean, look what happened to kudzu. There's absolutely no risk. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, I mean, um, there, there is with any, anything, any living thing. I mean, if I'm, even if I'm transporting across to a different bioregion in the U.S., I mean, it's, I mean, there's a risk. Um, I mean, mushroom, but here's the thing. Mushrooms produce spores not seeds and spores are very lightweight and they, they, they travel all over the world. You know? uh, they get drafted up from the shores of Africa and carry over here and hurricanes and, and they land. And we still have this level of uh, harmony. So mushrooms are really good at holding down the fort and out competing here. So um, much different than plants, plants are different. So uh, I would say there's a far less risk of introducing a fungal species. I would be more concerned about a pathogen, you know, um, the uh, fungi that are parasitic or are <laughs> parasitic on plants and trees or, you know, as a plant pathogen, you know, like a rust or, or uh, aspergillus, botrytis, those are, those, are those are pathogens of plants. So, um, some mushrooms have kind of escaped and been really aggressive. We've got golden oyster mushrooms fruiting everywhere. You know, they say that that one's um, maybe out competing some of the native, uh, other native mushrooms. It's not a parasite, but it is able to get a foothold and maybe out compete some of the other native oyster mushrooms. But it's not really a problem, right? They're decomposing and uh, breaking down the wood. So um, I would be concerned if it was a parasite. That's all. Rick, did you want to add anything to that one? Yeah, I agree with Trad. I think the, the spores are so widespread um, that the, you know that they're they're going to they're going to take wherever the opportunity arises. Um, you know, I, I don't know that we would have much control over that to say you know, but certainly pathogens like in plant pathogens especially uh, is something to watch out for. But I think. Um, kind of unintentional introduction of a native species would probably, you know, a, a fruiting species like a mushroom would, um, would probably not be my top concern. Yeah, and let me add one quick thing on the end of that, uh, that you made me think of that, Rick, <laughs> is that it's the, the species that are here that are native, have they have substrate recognition of what they are growing on here and something else that just gets introduced as a they're, they're kind of behind in the game. So genetically, they have a very hard time like out competing um, that recognition of our native plant species. Like if, if I was to reintroduce something from Jamaica here, not only would it have a time with substrate recognition, it would have a hard time with seasonal, you know, temperature uh, adaptability, which is what I'm going through personally right now. <laughs> All right, I think we got that one covered. Um, but if anyone had more specific questions about that, feel free to add them in the Q and A. Um, I'll jump now. You know, you've you've each touched on these other ecological benefits, and you know, far beyond the wonderful edible 
um, flavors that mushrooms offer. Um, what, what else should forest farmers in particular be thinking about in terms of best utilizing fungi for what, maybe that's, um, you know, micro remediation purposes, or as you've mentioned for soil building and, and plant health? What, what, are some, what are some of the low hanging fruit um, easiest practices that a forest farmer might use to get started with those? Uh, I, I would say too that um, Zeph Friedman uh, did some really good talks up at Organic Grower School about um, like if, if the forest is uh, sloped, you know, and tiered like this, that's a good opportunity to lay down logs to slow down uh, and prevent like really to capture that water and slow down erosion in those systems. So you could tier mushroom logs that are producing um, medicinals and edibles down a slope. And on the upside of that log is where you could put compost beds and grow, grow your forest plants and medicinals or even um, species of almond portobellos and things like that. So you can use a slope system and tear it down to, to slow erosion and also soil build. And now you have plants that are on, on the upside of those logs that are drilling into the soil and also slowing and preventing erosion at the same time. So there's, that was an interesting concept. I love Zev, it's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think um, we use beds of stropharia for sort of that purpose, just to slow the downhill flow of the water. We don't have a lot of erosion problems, but we've got them laid out um, uphill along our, our plant beds. Uh, just as kind of a water break. Um, the strawberry beds are nice because once they're colonized, they lock together pretty tightly. Um, and it makes kind of, you could even build like a, a berm out of them. Um, so strawberry, and again, for the soil building purposes, um, very easy to cultivate um, using basic materials like the, the, you know, free materials usually, straw and wood chips. So I, I would say that would be a really good one to start with you know, for forest farming purposes. So related to, this is sort of a different topic, but um, for microremediation purposes, there have been a few questions about what happens to the heavy metals if the mushrooms are removing them from the soil, um, what then do you do with those mushrooms? Are, can, are, are they then toxic or how does that work? Yeah, I, I think the only method of disposal that works that I've seen is um, feeding them to your in-laws. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, just kidding. Uh, uh, yeah, they do take up heavy metals. And um, I mean, you can test the fruiting bodies to see, you know, what the levels are. You can take them to an extension office, I think, and, you know, or um, the, the food science department of an extension. Just say, hey, you know, I'm really curious to see, um, there's not much you can do more than compost them, but now, I mean, you're not really eliminating from the system, you're moving them in a way. I mean, you're able to move them from one system, but then what do you do with them in the long run? Um, metals move, they don't remove. So things like herbicides and you know, molecular contamination, that seems to be handled by natural attenuation. The fungi break things down and then the bacteria come along and they start breaking down further. And then you have what's, what would, you would hope would be true bioremediation, but metals are, are movers. So um, I would pick those mushrooms and not consume them if, 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 if there is a known heavy metal contamination. That's, that's the biggest challenge. Why did someone ask that question? <laughs> because that's the hardest question to answer. And, um, but I'm glad they brought it up because it is a concern, you know, and uh, after the coal ash spill years ago, we remember that in North Carolina that, you know, we didn't know what to do and everybody was talking about mushrooms. And I said, hold on a minute. I don't think mushrooms are the answer here because what they could do is bring all this and concentrate it into a packet that is now bioavailable for wildlife, you know? So, um, Bio, microremediation is not the solution for um, every aspect of every contaminant of concern. You know, um, you just have to tread lightly on that topic with heavy metals. You know, molecular disassembly. I'm I'm on game. I'm on board. 
you know, no trans, there's little evidence to suggest translocation of molecular substances into a fruiting body, because we just did a study with the, with herbicides. That's a good paper that could be coming out soon. Um, yeah, I don't know where the spill is, Janelle's asking. Um, people are saying it, <laughs> they know the chat box is taking care of itself, you watch. <clears throat> so, um, it's, it's yet to be seen what you can do with these, you know, if there's um, a heavy metal spill or a heavy metal in the soil, you know. Dan, uh, Rick, do you have anything to add on that? Uh, I really don't. I think everything you said there makes makes it's, pretty good sense. It's complex. You know, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's a complex situation. So yeah. um, we... The only thing I could say is you may be able to, if you had a way to just harvest and dispose of the... Right. Uh, the mushrooms, um, you know, uh, you know, I'm, it, depending on the metal, it may have to go through hazardous waste channels. It may be a way to get the material out of the soil, I suppose, but um, then you still have to figure out what to do with it from there. Yeah, we, we were suggesting, uh, Furman University uh, dredged their lake and there was lead in it, okay? So we suggested dredging it and then putting it on a liner on land this is how complex, you want a complex answer from a complex question, all right, you're gonna get it. <laughs> so we're gonna put that soil on land and then grow wild mustards or wild sunflowers on it because those hyperaccumulate heavy metals, all right? Then we're gonna take that plant debris, dry it and grow mushrooms on that and then hyperaccumulate it even more. So now you're going back and forth, back and forth, from plant to mushroom systems until you've really hyper accumulated that and then go to, like Rick said, uh, hazardous waste disposal at that moment. Now you've really reduced the amount of volume that needs to be going to a hazardous waste facility. So it's, again, this is, <laughs> it's tricky. So it's tricky. Next question. Yeah, I appreciate those insights. Um, so another safety question, health question. Um, I do not do any indoor cultivation, so I have never been concerned about this, but any known issues with high spore count environments, um, handling spawn without gloves, handling many pounds of raw mushroom? Well, uh, what's on that? I'll, I'll, I'll go first, and what Rick can add is, but a uh, high spore count indoors, yeah, I mean, so uh, that could be uh, contributing to lung conditions of inhalation problems uh, for anyone who, I mean, even if you do not are not, uh, do not have a lung condition, uh, I've been in a, my fruiting room when, uh, especially oyster mushrooms are high spore bearing mushrooms if you let them go late. So uh, I would go in there and it would be a cloud. It would look foggy, you know, uh, the fans are on or the exhaust or everybody on a Monday, nobody picked over the weekend and you have all these mushrooms. Sound familiar, Rick? <laughs> He's, yeah, uh, sounds familiar. Um, pick young, pick the mushrooms young, like oyster mushrooms, pick them halfway grown and you will not have the spore load because if you're in that environment or if you notice that you walk in and it's very dense and you feel your chest is tight, open up the fans and blow that out before you go in there and pick. Um, that, that can give you you know, a severe cough for weeks. And um, I, um, I, I'm not sure what the long-term effects of it are, but it can't be good, you know? So pick the young, pick the mushrooms young on a Friday, pick them, pick them young, pick hard is what I see on a Friday. And what I do for indoor cultivation is I turn the air condition down to like 65 and I call it throttling. So I throttle the, uh, the fruiting room down and I chill it and that just kind of puts everything in suspension so they're not growing so fast over Saturday, Sunday. So I don't come back to an overgrown Monday. What you got, Rick? Yeah, I think that's, that's very good advice there. It's all about the schedule, maintaining the schedule, right? But uh, if I, just as a matter of practice, if I'm gonna be in my grow room for an extended period of time, if I've got a lot of picking to do, I'll typically put on an N95. Um, while I'm in there, it's, uh, it's a little uncomfortable, but uh, it does the trick. Um, you you can notice pretty much immediate irritation in your respiratory system if you if you're in a, a room with a lot of spores, especially oysters. I agree with that. Um, so the mask helps. Um, I do. I have heard 
at least anecdotally of allergies developing to mushroom spores um, over time, you know, repeated exposure. Um, so that's kind of my idea with the, with the mask is just to kind of head that off. But um, if I'm just going to be in there for a few minutes, you know, a little bit of picking to do, no big deal. But if I'm going to be in there for an hour at a time or more, then I'm definitely going to mask up. So. Oh, and, and so here's another thing that I, that frustrated me with um, some of my managers who are <laughs> the, the fruiting room. Um, and a mushroom, um, when it's half grown, okay, it's very tight. And so it's, you have to, it's, this is the, the art of mushroom picking or cultivation. Cultivating is easy. Picking is actually a little bit more of a skill um, to understand when do you harvest that? Because if you harvest it a day later, it'll last half as long in storage, right? So you have to know when to pick that. It's not like a tomato where you have a lot of time. I mean, you only have a day or two to understand when to pick it, okay? So it might weigh uh, a pound on day four, right? And it's nice and tight. And so, but I've had um, pickers who wait a day longer because, oh, it, it, looks, it looks like it's twice as large, right, Rick? It looks twice as big, but you know what? It weighs the same thing a day before and it's tighter. So, but they want to wait because it looks bigger. In reality, it's better to pick it tighter and it's not releasing spores on that day, but on the next day, it's clouding up the room. And so you, you get longer shelf life and you have less spore load by understanding when to pick it like a day earlier, right? So you just have to convey that to whoever's picking it, that's all. I find that it affects the flavor too. Um, especially like Strafaria rugosa annulata, I think the flavor is much better when they're a little tighter. Um, yeah, and I mean, they're more flavorful because they're, um, they're full of maggots. <laughs> <laughs> I try to I get them you. before that. I got you, buddy. <laughs> I got you, buddy. <laughs> Rick, did you want to add anything? I uh, know, I think that's like, pretty well you covered. Know, that one, right. So that leads really well into the um, wildlife predation question. What do you do, especially for forest grown uh, fungi to keep insects and slugs and other critters from damaging the mushroom crop? So I've been uh, with shiitakes, the primary, the main issue we have is with slugs. And so we've tried some different things. We've, we've tried stacking our logs on um, kind of gravelly, rocky surfaces rather than grassy areas. That seems to help a little bit. What I've found really is the most effective way is just to check your, your logs often and harvest promptly, um, you know, kind of beat them to it. That seems to be the most foolproof way because um, they, can, they can cause a significant amount of damage overnight. Um, so yeah, I think um, constant monitoring, harvest quickly, um, and try to keep them off of kind of moist, grassy areas if you can, especially while they're fruiting. Trad, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, so I'm going to channel Steve Gabriel right now, you know, and if I could just talk like him a little bit, I could just get by by talking like Steve Gabriel. No, that's a bad, that's, that's terrible. Delete that. Delete that from the video. He, uh, no, what he does a lot, he goes, uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so ducks, um, ducks are good. Um, so he uses ducks. Yeah, there it is. Somebody put it in there, uh, Stasha. And, and they go along and they don't bother the mushrooms at all. They just pop those damn slugs right off. So if you can corral the ducks, you know, to get in there and, and have some time with your shiitake logs or your mushroom logs, they'll just snap them right off. Um, another thing, which is common for gardeners, is uh, to leave out little saucers um, little tiny dishes or lids with, uh, with beer in there, right? The whole beer trick, right? Just don't put like really good, nice beer in there because your neighbor might come over or Rick might come over and drink it, right? You just see him down there sipping it out of there and then you got no slugs, you've got neighbors. So uh, you can put cheap malt liquor in there, <laughs> in there and just the, and put little saucers around your fruiting logs, they don't, you don't need to put them around like logs that are dormant. You can just put those saucers there 
and they'll vector in there, all right? Easy. Okay, we don't have very much time left, so I'm gonna try to squeeze in a couple more questions before <laughs> time is up. Um, one that I find really interesting, I don't know what research is out there on this, um, the question about the medicinal potency of um, forest-grown mushrooms versus indoor-grown on a um, sterile substrate. Thoughts on that? I can go. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so there, there's a, a, a couple different answers here. So. Um, what there's no really superiority question here because it's it's it can go both ways all right um mushrooms that are grown uh, yes mushroom uh the, the nutritional properties and the medicinal properties depend on their substrate okay so you grow them on just plain sawdust indoors um i mean that's the same as growing them on a log you know the same sawdust log out in the wild same thing now, are, is that mushroom going to be exposed to the different environment as that wild mushroom? Um, maybe and maybe not. Um, yeah, you're giving it uh, the wavelengths that it need. If you're giving it natural light, are you giving it LED light, all right? Yeah, someone says substrate does matter. It does matter, all right? So, but if you take a log or uh, sawdust and then you, supplement it with different supplements now you're giving it more than it can achieve on its native environment right so you're giving it uh it's you're supercharging that substrate um mushrooms that are grown artificially are they getting all the natural light vitamin d content are they exposed to the natural uh pathogens and predators that would that they can program them to defend themselves with and uh they're they're uh, manufacturing all those compounds into their tissue, right? That's what you want to do. Laboratory grown mushrooms, I would say, <laughs> or uh, mushrooms grown on grain and produced into uh, tinctures, I don't think are as nearly as potent as that. Um, I, I believe that you're going to grow them in a natural indoor fruiting room without spraying, without, um, without pesticides or anything organically and we have frogs and spiders everywhere we don't clean that much the fruiting room is like a little ecosystem that's it it's just a big humidity chamber outdoors uh the temperature i would i would uh advise that the cooler the temperature the the longer that that mushroom takes to grow the more interaction it has with the environment the more interaction that it has with the sunlight and so Mushrooms that are grown in the winter grow slower, so they are more potently medicinal than summer grown or heat grown mushrooms. I think that all makes really good sense, Trad, and yeah. especially the part about the, uh, the exposure to the sunlight, because we know that, um, especially I know shiitakes can sort of concentrate that vitamin D um, yeah. from the sunlight exposure. So you have to think that's one variable um, that not possible, but be hard to replicate indoors. Yeah, and I've seen um, someone was selling a black oyster mushroom online. I'm like, all right, well, <laughs> so I grew it at 80 degrees, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, and it was white. All right, so I uh, I know you, you just canceling this out, aren't you, Hannah? So <laughs> no, this is Katie, but we do we just have a couple minutes left, um, and I believe after we wrap. We'll hopefully stay on a little bit longer. Oh, I got gotcha. you. Okay. Right have on. time so we can, it's to be continued after Katie jumps in here. All right, Katie. Yeah, thanks so much, everyone. We'll just do a quick wrap up. Uh, we want to let everyone know that we have two more webinars coming up for farming ginseng on March 24th and Golden Seal and other NTFPs on April 14th. Again, we have archived uh, webinars of the saps and syrups and ramps already up on the website, and we'll have this one up in the next week. So I invite you to check out the website. We also um, invite you to become a member of the Appalachian Beginning Forest Farming Coalition. And you can also find us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and um, AppalachianForestFarmers.org. And we'd love to hear feedback from you all from the session today. There's a link that Stesha will be putting in the chat. So we invite, invite your feedback. We'd love to hear from you about 
how the session went and if you have any uh, ideas or just thoughts for us. And finally, um, the slide needs to be updated a little bit. It didn't, didn't catch up, I just added it, but I wanted to um, just extend gratitude to Trad, Cotter, and Rick and um, for just sharing your, your expertise today. This was such a fascinating and engaging talk and I'm really grateful that this will be a resource for our community. So thank you all so much. And I'd also like to thank Hannah for weaving this together so artfully and asking really engaging questions and um, making sure to answer the questions from the chat. So just love this team effort. And I also want to um, uplift uh, Stesha Warren who brought all these amazing people together. So thank you, Stesha. And uh, Margaret Bloomquist, who's in the background making this go very smoothly. And also Janine Davis, who's uh, managing the registration for all our events. So just really grateful for this team effort. And um, we'll, uh, yeah, if, if folks would like to stay on a little bit longer, we usually stay on 10 minutes or so just to see how many more questions we can answer. And we invite our speakers, if y'all have time, you're welcome to stay with us. Um, but we also have a lot of expertise on the team. So we're, well, we're um, definitely open to, to answering these questions for folks joining today. So lastly, thank you everyone for spending your evening with us. It's been a pleasure and we'd love to continue connecting with you. So loop, loop in if you haven't already. Um, and Hannah, I'll pass it back on over to you and um, Chad and Rick, if you have anything to share or if you're willing to stay on. Um, also want you to look at the chat. There's lots of gratitude streaming in for, for your yeah. time today. It's overwhelming. Um, I want to say thanks for having us here. And, and listen, don't if you're still on, don't log off. <laughs> I see the numbers dropping like the stock market. 144 at 145. Let's keep it at 140. Oh, 144. We lost one. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going to stay on for like 15 minutes or so. And I, I, I really want to thank you and your team, everybody, uh, for putting this on. And um, uh, this is really important to me, too. Th this was new information that I was sharing tonight on morels and stuff. And I think it's uh, just very interesting, you know. Um, so give, give us a year or two, three years. We all might be growing. We might have figured it out completely. It might not be such a mystery anymore, you know. That'd be wonderful. That would be <laughs> wonderful. That'd be amazing. <laughs> Look at me. Oh, I'll be right to be back. the middle of August, and that's still the first thing people ask for when they come up to us at the markets. You know, do you have morels? <laughs> I'll, show, I'll show you. I'm going to get the morels I just picked two days ago. Hold on. <laughs> well, yeah. and while we're on that topic, there have been a few questions about species that maybe we haven't totally figured out yet um, and what the future might hold for them. Um, so, Chad, I don't know. You're Okay, you're back. Questions about sawgill as a replacement for shiitake. I'm not familiar with that one. Um, chaga. Uh, there were a few others. So if, if folks had questions about specific um, species that are not on the, the cultivation list just yet, um, but you wanted to highlight some of those, you can throw them in the chat so we don't miss you if you are still here. Yeah, I mean, there, there's so many. Um, tiger sawgill is a, I mean, it's, it's edible but it's a relative of the shiitake and it's um it's very wiry like it's very very wiry stem you know and um it's got the same flavor profile a little bit of a shiitake but it's just not it's not meaty it's not going to get large and meaty like that i mean you could grow them and make flour out of them and then use them like uh to make powder and breading and stuff like this it's it's totally edible uh, that the one I use for microremediation the most because it has a really high tensile strength. We talked about erosion and things like that. So, um, I mean, that, that one has a tensile strength of like 800,000 to 1 million times its own weight, which is equivalent to steel. So, I mean, we're, we're doing all kinds of crazy stuff with that. Um, we're making bricks out of it, and <laughs> I made flip flops out of it. I, I made a pair of flip flops, I ate them, they were disgusting. So, I don't know. Just, just there's so many different things you can do with mushrooms in the woods. Yeah. How about chaga? I mean, chaga is a, it's a, it's a resting structure for you know that fungus. It's a sclerotia on a tree, and um, I don't know of anybody that's done any studies or inoculation or injury of you know birch trees up in the. Uh, it's it's a higher elevation tree, 
right? And it's an insane number. So there, there's actually an epidemic of over harvesting chaga in the Southeast, like here, because you're knocking off the battery, you know, knocking off, it's like taking a battery out of a car, you know? It's just, it, it can't run anymore. So if, you, if you're if you harvesting chaga out there, just take a little bit, take a little piece and leave some there for that fungus to be able to reproduce and sporulate later. Uh, I, I don't know of anybody who's like, inoculating birch trees intentionally, you know? That would be, um, I, I'd have to look that up and see if anybody's doing anything like that. Growing being done in Europe, hmm, okay. Um, another species someone was interested in hearing about is Cordyceps militaris. So if either of you like to share. I have not experimented with, uh, with growing that yet. Yeah, we uh, we've been growing it for a little bit. Not not I mean, not a lot. Just enough to produce some extracts and stuff like that. So we're not producing large volumes, but we've got um, there's some substrates uh, and formulas online. You can look at uh, William Padilla's stuff online. He's the one who really brought it to the U.S. Like he really he really brought it. Now it's mainstream. Everybody's doing it because it will. But um, check out uh, William Padilla. Uh, I'll put his name in there. Uh, mycosymbiotics, I think. Mm -hmm. Symbiotics. If you look at mycosymbiotics, um, he has a little manual on how to do it. And he sells syringes and has the there. And it's if you have a pressure cooker, you can grow cordyceps at home. That's it. It's it. It's that easy. What about Paul Stamets? <laughs> Um, let's see, uh, uh, I wanna make sure I'm not missing critical ones. There are a lot of specific questions about um, best practices for cultivating certain species. So I don't think we have a lot of good time for, for those kinds of questions in this space. But, you know, speaking of, of Will's work, one of the things that's really inspiring to me is just how accessible all of this is. <laughs> um, you know, he's, Will is even just using um, equip, equipment that he's purchasing, lab equipment um, that he's using at home for a lot of this really interesting work. And it's inspiring to me and relates to the last question that I was going to ask you all, which is, um, you know, there's so much that we don't know about fungi. So if there's any question that if you could wave a magic wand to have solved, what, what would it be and to what end? I guess I would want to know how to speak mushroom <laughs> to, to understand, like I mentioned it earlier, but to really understand kind of uh, the, the mycelial kind of interface between the mushrooms and, and their environment. And I, I, I really think that's going to be um, kind of an exciting space to look into over the next few years. We can go through these and, you know, type some responses if we're running out of time, but um, one question towards the end here. When will your new book be released, Fred? <laughs> when I have time. <laughs> uh, my okay. publisher, I'm probably driving my publisher nuts. Um, I, I'm really excited about the next one. And uh, again, I'm, I'm traveling to Jamaica and Costa Rica a lot this year. So I'm hoping just to sit. I, ne I, need, to get, I need to get out of here and disconnected to focus on it. It's, there's too much going on. Um, but I, even people, listen, if you're on in the chat, oh, we only lost 10 people in the last 30 minutes. That's great. And uh, that's good. Um, I'm listening to what I'm seeing in the chat and I see what information is wanted or needed out there. You know what I mean? So I saw something about, you know, something that I was working on and I, I said, I'm going to add it to the book. I'm going to look into it. And so, uh, that's. That's what takes me so long to write a book is because I'm uh, what my college advisor said. I'm not a procrastinator. All right, Rick, Rick, you could use this at home. Okay. Anybody listening, <laughs> I'm not a procrastinator. I'm an incubator. <laughs> see, how that, see how that goes for you. But um that's, that's what one of my professors said. And I'm like, I agreed with them. And then, you know, someone else didn't. <laughs> so.
So yeah, it, it could be a year of writing and then a half a year of editing. So I'm really hoping to, uh, uh, I, let's see this year. So maybe Telluride Mushroom Festival 2023. So check out Telluride Mushroom Festival. If you're, uh, I know we're getting off in a minute, so you can reach me through mushroommountain.com. I've got a contact page there. If, if you did not get your question answered and we've been just chatting about stuff, um, it's uh, it's not goodbyes, right? I don't so, think there's actually a great function for being able to answer the questions after the fact. So some of them will have to, um, yeah, follow, follow up with us if you wanna yeah, totally. be answered. And Rick, right. sorry to cut you off. What were you saying? Oh, no, I just, I, I second what Trad said. If, if any questions for me come up afterwards, feel free to reach out directly. <laughs> Thank you both. Yeah, hey, man. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing time. It's been great hanging out with you both. Nice to meet you all. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you all again. Yep, so I'm gonna stop the